everybody, and thanks for coming out tonight. We're a great crowd here tonight. Uh, my name is Ian MacArthur. I'm the president of the Bird Mountain Naturalists. Um, our club was formed in 1989 uh, by residents of the Tri-Cities interested in enjoying nature and conserving local green spaces. Uh, in our conservation work, our club volunteers are often working alongside city staff as we value the collaborative relationships we have developed over the decades with city staff and with other environmental groups. All of us share the goal of protecting and conserving green space in the Tri-Cities, which we know is essential uh, for the well-being of our communities now and in the future. The Burke Mountain Naturals are proud to sponsor this evening's event, the Tri-Cities Urban Forest Forum. In partnership with the group's Wondrous Tree Fellowship and Protect Coquitlam's Urban Forest. In bringing together city staff, elected officials, and members of the public to hear from experts about how to best protect and manage our forests, we hope this forum will be the first step in an ongoing process of discussion and collaboration to ensure a healthy future for our urban forests in each of the Tri Cities and in the wider Metro Vancouver region. I want to thank you to have, who have come out tonight, and with particular, I want to uh, acknowledge some elected officials. Uh, we have three councillors from Coquitlam uh, joining us tonight. We have uh, Joama, Hodge, and Marzillo. And if there's anybody else that's popped in in the last few minutes, maybe you can put your hand up or holler out. But we may be having some more join us uh, later on through the evening. Uh, we've received regrets from members of the Port Coquitlam Council as their regular city council meeting tonight from the, sorry, the city of Coquitlam had uh, their regular meeting tonight. And also members from Port Moody Council who have a public hearing tonight. Uh, but they've asked for a link uh, to our presentation and we'll watch it afterwards. I will now hand the mic over to our MC this evening. Uh, Dr. Nancy Furness, and we support volunteer of the Energy and Wonders Tree Fellowship and with the Riverview Horticulture Center Society. So thank you, Nancy. So thank you, Ian, so much for those opening words. And uh, welcome, everyone, to the Tri Cities Urban Forest Forum. And I just want to say, what could be more wonderful than a whole room full of people wanting to talk about trees? So give yourself a hand. We're so pleased that you're here. And I just want to start by acknowledging that our event tonight is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of Coquitlam First Nation. And we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to care for these lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. And I really hope that in some way our forum tonight will help us to continue on down that path of good stewardship. So trees are critical to the well-being of our communities. And a healthy urban forest provides many valuable ecological services. It helps to mitigate the effects of climate change. And it's also integral to both our physical as well as our mental well-being. And the health of our regional um, urban forests are currently uh, facing uh, some really critical and complex challenges. So things like increased development, we have population pressures on our parks and our natural spaces. And we also, of course, have a rapidly changing climate to deal with. So the good news is that the Tri-Cities municipalities are currently working on urban forest management plans. And a, a really robust urban forest management plan is something that will enable us to, in some way, ensure that um, we have a healthy urban forest, both now and in the future. Public awareness and engagement are key elements to the success, um, successful development and implementation of urban forest management plans. And tonight, I think we have a really unique and exciting opportunity. We've got some elected officials with us tonight. We have city staff, 
we have expertise in the room, and we also have all of you, the public. So I think um, we have a really exciting evening ahead, and hopefully we can have some good conversations. I also would like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television for being here. Um, by giving us coverage and, and footage of tonight's event, it'll help us to reach out to a, a wider audience. And now we have tonight some, um, we're hosting four really exciting speakers that we're looking forward to hearing from. We're going to ask that we listen to all four speakers and hold questions until the end. There will be an opportunity for questions and, and discussion and conversations, but just for the sake of time and management, we're going to wait and hold those until the end. So I am just going to jump right in because we have a lot to do here, and I'm going to introduce our first speaker. So Richard Boas is Section Manager of the Environmental Sustainability Operations of the District of North Vancouver. And Richard has specialized in urban watersheds and geoscience for over 28 years with the District of North Vancouver. Most of his work focuses on integrated natural resource management and watershed assessment and restoration. He is currently the Section Manager of Environmental Sustainability, where he supervises a staff of professionals responsible for delivering environmental permitting services, including the award-winning Natural Hazards Management Program for New Development and Development Permits. His passion in bringing science and young scientists together has been the primary driver behind numerous graduate-level research projects on topics including metal contamination of urban runoff to rainfall intersection of urban tree counties. He is responsible for writing most of the district's tree protection and natural environment protection policy and is also vice president of the Partnership for Water Sustainability in BC, which is a nonprofit that assists with province wide initiatives promoting water sustainability. Richard is also our technical expert tonight, so I don't know if you realize that. Don't know if you realize what you got yourself into. Anyways, please join me in giving Richard a very warm welcome. say that it is it's a pleasure to be here and I'm also honored um, to be invited to the traditional territory of the Coquitlam uh, nation to, to talk with you about trees something that I happen to be actually very excited and passionate about so without further ado we're gonna get uh oh oh there we go okay I moment of panic there for a second. So who am I? Um, why do I care so much about trees? And then I'm going to talk about urban forests, my own vision, definitions. You're going to hear some brand new terms. Um, I like to invent stuff. Um, and then we're going to talk, hopefully most of the time we're going to talk about what, is, what are our concepts for successful urban forestry. So I have been involved in the outdoors for a very, very long time. Um, I started as a teenager at 15, traveling the northern parts of the Yukon and Northwest Territories, working in the woods. Uh, and I was out in the woods before that, and it was then with my dad that I learned and began my passion for trees. My dad was a land surveyor, and my dad, uh, in the 40s and 50s, was running around in the woods surveying much of the roads that we now travel in northern BC and things like that. And he would often talk and point out different trees to me and he knew so much about it and I just found it fascinating. Um, like the introduction, uh, I started work at the district in 1994, not quite one year after the district adopted what was likely the first comprehensive environmental bylaw in the province and possibly in Canada. And I was brought on in 1994 to administer the permitting system associated with that bylaw. Oh, oh no, there we go. So I have been involved in local government and trees for a very, very long time. 
Um, the picture here is from the uh, one of the many sort of exciting and innovative research projects that I've been involved with, and this is the partnership that I had in 2010 with the UBC uh, Faculty of Forestry. And what you're looking at is the equipment that we designed, and I built uh, 75 of these things in my garage. And we use these devices to measure the rainfall canopy interception of an urban tree. At the time, it was uh, precedent research because much was known about how rainfall interacts with trees that are in a forest setting, but no one really knew about trees in an urban setting. And trees in an urban setting are very different uh, than trees in a forest setting. They're exposed to all kinds of different stimuli and as a result they grow differently, they have different shapes and structures. So we were interested in looking at that. So what is an urban forest? Well, this is the definition I got from Wikipedia. I'm sure you can find other similar definitions around. How many people think this definition actually cuts it? Probably no one. Well, that's good because in this day and age, with everything we know that's going on, this is not an appropriate definition for an urban forest. And why that is, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So up here is a picture of the District of North Bend's Climate Change Adaptation Strategy. I saw a former colleague of mine, Julie Pavey, I think she's with Port Moody. Uh, it was Julie's initiative that got this work underway. And uh, I had the, well, it was a fairly easy task to, to take it over and, and run with it, but this was something that Julie started and Council adopted this in 2017. And I don't know if you can read the bullets there, but each of those highlighted bullets talk about how important biodiversity, urban forestry, and tree health is to the district's climate change adaptation strategy. These were huge priority items for us looking forward into the face of climate change. Uh, after, after Julie left, shortly after came our uh, Community Energy and Emissions Plan, the SEEP. Most local governments have developed a SEEP plan. And this is this uh, section from the uh, summary of our SEEP, which talks about the importance of urban forestry to the district's energy and emissions plan. While not many of the forestry actions identified in the SEEP are going to directly uh, transfer to our goals of, of reducing carbon emissions and, and trying to get carbon net neutral in 2050, one of the interesting things with the public outreach that we did for our SEEP program was the way the public viewed every one of our forestry initiatives. All the forestry initiatives were consistently viewed in the public as being more important, more favorable, and um, generated more interest. So again, very interesting. So it talks about how important these are to the community. So I mentioned I, I like to make up stuff. Here's the first, the first time tonight I'm gonna to be able to say you saw it first here. So this is, what, this is my definition of, of an urban forest. The cumulative biomass of dead and alive woody perennials and the associated understory whether it's purposely placed or not, that as a managed natural asset provides important services to the urban and suburban setting around it. Yes. That speaks to the whole. It speaks to the services that the trees, the vegetation, and the biodiversity of an urban forest presents to our community. So you heard, you heard it first here. Okay, I'm going to go through these really quickly because probably everyone in the room, including the panel here, knows a lot more about this stuff than I do. I'm not an arborist. I'm just a person that's walked in the woods for many years and I like to observe, record my thoughts, and think about stuff. So, we know that an urban forest provides all these sort of biological services that I categorized here. Um, provisional services. Trees in the urban forest give the community things. Whether it's food, that's a picture of my urban garden. I consider an urban garden plot a part of an urban forest. 
Uh, genetic supply, raw materials, um, medicinal and cultural importance for indigenous peoples. Again, the, the list is going on and it's by in no means uh, exhaustive what I've put down here. Cultural social services. These are the services that I think many, many local governments undervalue when it comes to healthy, green, urban forests and natural environments within our urban settings. This list, again, is not exhaustive, but just think about it. Improved medical outcomes for people exposed continuously to healthy and urban forests. Amazing stuff. It's, it's incredible. All kinds of research on, on there. And, uh, I would encourage people to look at it. Here's another word I'm making up here. Physiolutionary services. <laughs> Physio is the word, a Greek word, of or to do with nature. And I've added my lutionary bit because we're in a time right now where we've got to, we've got to do something, we've got to do it pretty quick. If we expect to evolve and combat the things that we're facing now when it comes to climate change, the way the Earth, the Earth's atmosphere and things are changing in and around us, and I don't think we're responding quickly enough. And so that's why I've created this term here. Why is this important in the region? Well, this slide shows you, this is data from the Metro Vancouver's 2019 study in the regional tree canopy assessment work. 36% of all the region's uh, occupied land mass is still single family. And to my knowledge, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of incorporating and promoting on lot private property, tree canopy, and forest uh, afforestation strategies when it comes to this single family land base. It's the single largest land base. We cannot sit back and think that the parks and recreation, we're blessed, we've got trees and parks everywhere, we're good. It's not like that. And the main reason is, is that the trees in our parks, they're not mitigating anything in terms of the, uh, the benefits that are needed by the people that live right next to them. This is a, a graph from the same report, and this shows that of these uh, cities, and the trend is, is fairly similar across the entire region, we are seeing a decline in measured urban tree canopy across the region. And it's concerning when you look at all the things we're facing, growth, pressures on transportation, infrastructure, all this kind of stuff. Here's another slide that shows currently where all the region's municipalities are in terms of their urban tree canopy, and this is 2019 data. All the Tri-Cities are here. The interesting thing you can see is that the municipalities that have the highest canopy there on the right, a lot of those municipalities, like the district, they're the ones that back onto um, interface wild, wild uh, forest lands. And again, we, we seem to have fallen into this, uh, I think, unwarranted sense of comfort, thinking we've got all kinds of trees, we're going to be fine. But like I said, the trees up there in the forest aren't mitigating much when it comes to urban life. So, now we're getting into the meat of it. What is and what might be urban successful urban forestry? Well, after 30 years or so watching uh, looking, writing permits and all of this, the very first thing that needs to, to happen is this integrated community plans and, and planning. And examples of that you saw were our climate change adaptation strategy and our SEED, which are corporate level documents adopted by council strategic visions and goals, but yet a lot of our bylaws haven't been uh, amended to reflect and, and help us achieve these corporate strategy and visions. That's what I mean by integrated policy and planning. You need these corporate, st corporate strategies. Identify what your goals and visions are for your canopy and how are you going to achieve it? How are you going to fund it, importantly? And then how are you going to measure it? Development permit areas. I've got a lot of experience with development permit areas, but again, it's a policy regulatory tool. Development permit area is simply an area of land that's been identified as requiring certain uh, best management practices in order to undertake change to it. Bylaws, uh, again, it's a regulatory tool, they're important. 
I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about the last two incentive programs and voluntary uh, afforestation programs and strategies because we're just starting to dabble with these in North Van and I, I got to say this, the, the success in terms of community awareness and uptake has been really surprising. And then what we need to do to throw, we need to throw this outreach blanket over everything that I just mentioned because our community, if our community isn't aware of all of these physiolutionary services we get from trees, how are they going to support activities at the local government level designed to meet those goals? Um, outreach. I saw a program here, I grabbed it, the Cool Hoods Chance program here. These kinds of outreach uh, programs and strategies are critical to success. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that success is why it's so um, critical. So this is some uh, research from um, a wonderful bi biologist that I have the, the opportunity to work with. And she did her master's thesis on looking at and surveying the construction industry. And this is just some of the data that she collected. And what's important here is she surveyed dozens and dozens of contractors. So these are people in the industry building homes on the North Shore. And she asked them, where does the storm drain system go? 36% of the contractors building our community had no idea. So while we're talking about storm drains and watershed protection and stuff, what I wanted to emphasize with this slide is the importance of outreach. Our region is growing dramatically. We are welcoming new residents to our region from hundreds of countries throughout the world. They are coming to this place to live for a better life. And many of them know, don't know the first thing about West Coast Forest and what it means to walk underneath a beautiful 100 or 200 year old cedar tree. We owe it to ourselves to bring those new people of our community into alignment with our strategic goals. We, we will not have success if we're not doing that. Uh, I, mentioned, um, I mentioned, here's your slide. So this is from the city of Vancouver. City of Vancouver's done a wonderful program where they've, uh, and this is a, a page from their urban forestry update program in 2018. So what the slide shows here is, this is the city of Vancouver's urban forestry strategy. And if we can imagine that purple wheel spinning and turning around, you can see that eventually, when that orange wheel turns, all of these other gears are gonna start to turn. So there's a relationship. So these are the, their ecological-based goals. They've got a, an avian or a bird strategy. They've got a biodiversity strategy. Things that we're also working on. And then they have their corporate vision and goals. The only thing that I might suggest for this slide is that I would have liked to have seen that purple hub right in the middle. Because I believe firmly that an urban forestry program is going to drive all of those things at the same time, not one after another. So, we're going to get into a little bit of details around zoning and things like that. So, for local government background, the community charter confers the authority to local governments to regulate trees. But there are limitations, and this is why things like development permit areas and bylaws are not the only and sole answer. A bylaw cannot prevent uses that are permitted under the zoning of, for that land. And if they do, local governments are liable to pay compensation for lost use of that property or potential loss of value associated with the property. So this is a very big thing. And it's been something that local governments and especially tree protection advocates have struggled with for a long, long time. And this is what it means in a slide. So the zoning bylaw establishes the allowable footprint for a building of to go on a property. And that's what you can see is that uh, blue patch line with the uh, sort of the light blue square in the middle. That's the allowable footprint under the zoning. So 
What it's saying is, is that it's very difficult to protect trees anywhere inside that because you're affecting the use and the allowable use of that property under the zoning. So what that leaves us is that green area around the exterior. And now we talk a little bit about why integrated planning is so important. If your zoning bylaw allows certain things like significant below grade structures and basements, that just the, uh, the method of constructing a basement on a property requires a property line to property line excavation covering three quarters of that property. How do you retain trees? So it's daunting. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And that's why we need, we need change. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about large trees in the region. Uh, in the district and other places, I think we're struggling with this mightily. And it's a problem that we don't know how to treat, we don't know how we're going to deal with. So the picture on the right you can see is, it's a massive Douglas fir tree. That Douglas fir tree is one and a half meters in diameter. It's on the district boulevard. It's right beside a bus route. It's been previously topped. It's got what they call a co-dominant stem on it. And you can see, looking at the canopy, the, the structure is pretty good, but it's, it's looking a little thin. And, and we're, we're finding trees like this, Douglas firs especially, are becoming exponentially hard to manage with uh, municipalities' limited resources Climate change is, is weighing heavily on these kinds of trees. Douglas fir trees, their natural propensity to manage themselves when they're solitary like this is they shed limbs. A Douglas fir tree this size, one limb can weigh 400 pounds. So this is the kind of issue that we're facing and what we want to do now is we want to uh, affect a, a paradigm shift in how we plan these things so we don't get to this stage. Removing a tree like this is, is divisive to the neighborhood. The people that live and look at that tree love the tree. They see the birds, they see the habitat it provides. There's no way they want that tree gone. But yet if that tree is on your property and for the fourth time in five years you're repairing a hole in your roof, it becomes a challenge. So the whole idea is, is, is to revisit urban forestry so that we we avoid those situations. So here's an example. This is a large diameter tree. Managing these trees became so problematic in the district that we created a new category specific to our tree bylaw called large diameter tree. This was a 1.3 meter diameter cedar tree and it was right in the corner of that property. You can kind of see the road on the right, the house on the left, the property's undergoing redevelopment. We couldn't save that tree, even when it was right in the corner of the property. So what the district did is we used some of the research that, again, um, I, I mentioned already, and we've embedded a 20% canopy target for every single family lot, and it's a, it's a subtle guideline that's involved in our tree bylaw. And what we've done is we've, we've categorized these trees and said the owner of this tree can remove it. They will, they will be granted a permit. But they need to either compensate the district for the loss of that tree by either planting new trees on their property or adding money to a fund that I'll talk a little bit about later that we are using to meet our afforestation goals. And so you can see in uh, last year in 2022, we raised the compensation fee to remove a large diameter tree on your property is uh, $2,000, and that's for one cedar or one Douglas fir tree. It's $1,000 for a large diameter tree of other species. So that was seen to do two things, to help us generate revenue to fund our afforestation strategy, but to also act as more of a deterrent to have developers and homeowners work around retaining large, healthy trees like that that are off in the corner. So this is some research that I did um, 20 or 2008, 2009, I think. And this is what's happening around the district, and this is what's going to happen in Coquitlam and other places eventually. So what the image shows is that 
As we measure loss of canopy and change to land over redevelopment, we're seeing a massive shift in impact generative um, conditions on our single family property. It's amazing, and yet, and this is what I talk about, those forests that are off in the back, port, back 40, they are important, but they're not mitigating much when it comes to hard surface, urban heat island, air quality, things like that. So this was amazing, and this, this is why I knew, and this is a slide that we used to talk a little bit about how we arrived at our 20% canopy. We determined that a 20% tree canopy through the rainfall research we did was the optimum number, and this slide just shows you examples of various canopy coverages on different properties within the district. So I talked about revenue to fund one of our deforestation programs. Two and a half years ago, we decided after waiting for changes to happen to our zoning bylaw and all of these other integrated high level planning uh, projects to get underway, we couldn't wait around. So what we did is we decided to adopt a program and work with people who wanted to learn about trees and wanted trees. So we launched this program. It's funded by that compensation revenue that I just talked about for large diameter trees. So those compensation fees for removing a large diameter tree goes into a special account. And then that account is used to fund these programs where we run a program every year and we give native trees to anyone who wants them by providing an address in the district of North End. And remember I talked about the importance of outreach? This project here has been incredible. It's a huge community event now. The firefighters come out and help. Here's a, a couple of gentlemen from our streets crew that come and help and, and carry uh, buckets full of trees into people's Subarus or whatever it is they're driving and off they go and they plant a tree and we talk and we talk outreach. We talk about the importance of these trees. We're providing hundreds and hundreds of native trees on hundreds of properties. It's not a lot, it's not something that's going to change uh, our percentage of tree canopy even in the next 10 or 15 years, but it's the outreach that's important. The other thing that we're working on right now currently is a hazard tree uh, mitigation program. Climate and pests have, have and are impacting our forests dramatically. The looper moth, the heat dome, have all had a very serious impact on our forest. Uh, I talked to someone in the audience, Aaron, I think. We were both at a seminar or a session a week or so ago. And as I was driving up the hill, I couldn't believe what I was seeing with all the cedar trees around the, uh, the hillside. Same thing's happening in North Van. The cedar trees are struggling because they can't adapt to the rate that the climate's changing. I, my personal feeling, it's all about hydrology and soil moisture. These large urban cedar trees need a lot of water and we put them into places where they're just not going to be successful now. So, right now, our forest is, creates a problem for us going into the future. You know, uh, high-risk fuels tree failure incidents with the recreation and all this kind of stuff, and then uh, geomorphic instability associated with uh, dead or, or diseased stands of trees on very steep mountain slopes. So this is some picture of some data we collected. We used to run uh, an inspection program. This is 9,000 inspections that we've done from 20, 2007 to 2013. Most of these dots represent hazard tree inspections. So, certain trees are protected under our bylaw, but under our bylaw, a permit to obtain a, a permit to remove a hazard tree, there's no fee and there's no replanting, but we still issue a permit. There's cost, there's staff time, and we're getting no recovery of uh, these physio services back for this. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to come up with a program and we're going to use that same fund and we're going to generate target areas and we're going to offer homeowners a one-time grant of, of hopefully money to assist them in doing their own hazard tree mitigation work. 
Imagine that large Douglas fir tree I showed you earlier on in the presentation, the co-dominant stem. That's a $10,000 item for a homeowner and a bear to remove that tree. So it's a significant amount of money. So what we're doing now is we're saying we're, we'll still give you a free permit, but why don't we work with giving you some money to help with the cost, but in exchange, you're going to do some replanting for us, and you're going to do some fire smart upgrades to your yard. So right now, we're probably going to target areas that are adjacent to our urban interface wildland or our wildfire urban interface areas where we know we're managing interface fire risk. Our program now deals strictly with district owned land. We don't do much other than our development permit area on private land. So this is a program that's going to meet a bunch of our goals for our seat, for our climate change adaptation, adaptation strategy because we're going to be working directly with private property to help them build healthy and biodiverse forests on their land. So, to finish up here again, people know this, um, trees, they are the purest form of green infrastructure. They provide all kinds of different benefits to our community, to the property, to things around them, and they're generally low risk, especially if they're managed. Remember my definition? of urban forest, when managed as a natural asset, they can do this. We don't plant and forget anymore. They are probably the best investment you can make in terms of an appreciating asset. You plant a tree now, and it's going to continue to provide more and more of all those services as it grows and matures. It's a multifaceted approach, like I think I've tried to explain. There's all kinds of things that go into an urban forestry program. Make sure your corporate and strategic visions have some details, have some targets that you can communicate to the residents, that you can have and talk about in sessions like this that says, we want to plant this many trees. We'd like to try to do this by this year. It's important to have those goals. I talked about multicultural outreach. We are, we have, are still grappling with how we're going to do that. It is critical in this region, absolutely critical. And then I think the last thing I want to talk about is, is our urban forests have to be added to our operational budget ledger and given the same degree of priority when it comes to fixing, uh, fixing our sidewalks, replacing street lights, upgrading uh, watersheds and, and putting riprap in our creeks. It's got to change. We've got to treat our urban forests equally and we've got to apply an asset management lens to them. Thank you very much. so much Richard for giving us I think a really good understanding of what the urban forest is and also um, for telling us oh, um, the importance of a multifaceted my next introduction um, and also the importance of a multifaceted approach in order to ensure that our urban forests uh, remain healthy now and in the future. And also, thank you, Richard, for giving us a whole new vocabulary. <laughs> so things that we never heard of before. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Lorian Nesbitt. And Dr. Lorian Nesbitt is an assistant professor of urban forestry and environmental justice in UBC's Faculty of Forestry. Her research focuses on urban forestry and environmental justice using a social eco ecological lens. Additional areas of research interest and activity include the role of urban forests in human health and well-being, um, nature-based solutions to climate change and climate justice, and the use of smart technologies in understanding and managing urban social ecological systems. So please join me in giving Dr. 
Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. And um, I wanted to start by just saying I think it's a great time to be talking about urban trees here in the Lower Mainland. Um, urban forests have been getting a lot of attention recently. We experienced the heat dome a couple of years ago. You know, the effects of climate change are becoming more and more apparent in our lives. Um, during the heat dome, I spent a lot of time uh, with my son in, in or close to water as much as possible or looking for shade um, as much as possible because my house was just way too hot. And so I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing more interest in urban forestry and we're calling on trees to do more for us. Um, we also, I think, I don't know if I'm just not aiming this correctly, but it's not really, maybe I'll just walk around this way. Um, we're also, I think, during the pandemic, um, because people uh, have been socializing more outside, we've become more aware of, of our trees and urban nature, and I think that's really important as well. When I first started uh, my PhD in urban forestry at UBC, I wrote to the um, Associate Dean of Graduate Studies and said, I'd like to work with someone on urban forestry. She said, what is that? And I don't think we would get, I, or I would get that response uh, nowadays. So, so I think it's a really interesting time to be doing this work. And I appreciate all of your work um, in this field as well, and your interest. So I'm going to talk briefly about urban forest values, and then environmental justice and urban green equity, and then um, and with green gentrification and a bit of a conceptual framework. And that question sitting is wrong, because that will be at the end. So this is like a, this is, you will eventually get questions, but not right now. Um, great. So, um, kind of interesting that Richard started with the definition of urban forest, because I'm going to give one as well. Um, typically, they're defined as trees and associated vegetation in urban environments or tree dominated urban ecosystems, or people often talk about urban green space or urban green spaces. I, um, just so we're all on the same page, I think of urban forests as social ecological systems. So systems where trees and urban vegetation are centered, but where those trees and that vegetation are living with the built environment and with the humans in that built environment that make up cities. And so these, um, that sort of expands my conception of the urban forest to include things like street trees, parks, urban woodlands, cemeteries, golf courses, urban gardens, all of the places where we can interact with nature, where we need to care for nature and where it can care for us. And of course, we always talk about ecosystem services. Um, I made this slide a long time ago, and I like it less and less every year. But um, we're becoming more aware of the services and benefits that urban trees provide us. And our awareness of those services and benefits has helped raise the profile of <coughs> urban forests and help us allocate more money to their management. So it's some old research, but People used to, especially, and a little bit now, like to put a <clears throat> monetary value on um, urban forests. And so there's all this um, research on how much the sort of monetary value of improved air quality is from trees in cities, um, the monetary value of reducing flooding in cities, um, and uh, the monetary value of reducing temperatures. Of course, these values would be much higher now because this is super old research. But part of the reason I didn't update this research is also because I think that we need to move beyond some of this economic valuation of urban trees and look at different ways in which um, trees are providing benefits for us and what that means and what we need to provide for them as well. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, of course, we also know about all these health benefits that urban trees provide, so we're more and more aware of physical health benefits, um, reduced air pollution and respiratory illness, Increased opportunities for recreation and physical activity, improved pregnancy outcomes has been a big theme in the literature. Um, and more and more we're seeing um, research on the psychological health benefits of urban trees, so lower stress, more positive attitudes. Um, we've recently published papers on um, lower incidence of childhood ADHD amongst um, children who live and grow up and then learn around urban nature, and um, improved early childhood development as well for those populations. And then there's also more interest in the social health benefits that we get from being around urban trees. And I feel like that's probably something that people relate to easily. Um, you know, you, I respect, have had experiences of being out in nature and connecting with your friends and family or your community and experiencing increased social health because of that. Assuming that you were able to do so in a safe way and a welcoming way um, in your community and in your neighborhood. 
So all of these benefits have led to interest in what's called urban green equity, which is sort of a subset or like a subdiscipline of environmental justice. It's typically referred to as fair, um, or defined as fair access to or governance of urban forests, regardless of differentiating factors such as socioeconomic status, racialization, or other ways in which we like to differentiate ourselves from one another, put each other into boxes, and then um, enforce power or asymmetries upon each other. Um, generally, it's conceived of as having these three dimensions. So there's distribution, recognition, and procedure. I'm going to talk a lot about the distribution part because that was part of what the request was. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about these other two dimensions when I get into green gentrification. Um, so I did some research back in my PhD that was um, looking at the distribution of um, woody vegetation, mixed vegetation, and parks. And we found across 10 metro areas in the United States that typically those who had higher incomes and more education were more likely to have good access to um, especially uh, trees and other vegetation close to their houses. And we found um, in some cases that those who were racialized were less likely to have good access. We also looked at this in Canada recently um, in research led by one of my PhD students and we looked at 31 municipalities across the country and we found really variable uh, patterns, of uh, patterns of access or patterns of uh, distributional equity. In the Vancouver area, there was um, fairly good evidence of um, better access to urban greenness by those who have higher incomes. Not surprisingly, in a region like ours that is very expensive. We also found sort of a funny thing that um, millennials were less likely to have access to urban greenness. Um, this was sort of like a, like a pet peeve of my PhD student, I guess. She's a younger millennial, I'm an older millennial. Um, so she decided to include this in the analysis. I don't know what's wrong with our generation, but we don't have enough access to <laughs> um, But I, I should say that it's um, certainly not like widespread in Canada that we all have inequitable access. It's not a guarantee that um, urban forests are inequi inequitably distributed, and in about a third of cities we didn't find any evidence of um, inequity, so that's good news. Um, in Vancouver, it's the city of Vancouver we've also found um, in research led by Andrew Jarvis, who is a PhD student at UBC, that areas um, with uh, higher residential instability, which means more um, renters, neighborhoods with um, lower incomes or more material deprivation, and higher ethnic concentration as defined by um, Statistics Canada, so fewer white people, were less likely to um, have access to public parks. They, were, they had lower residential greenness, a lower residential exposure to water, and higher residential exposure to buildings and pavement. So certainly in our region, there are some things to attend to around distributional equity. And um, there's more and more research on this. Um, so it's becoming something that cities are aware of. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about what some cities are doing about it. So Portland, uh, one of the first cities that I spent time, where I spent time talking to urban foresters, they've been aware of some of these equity issues for a long time, since about 2004, when they first mentioned this in their management plan. Um, they also have a policy called Building Racial Equity Together, where they're working with um, low canopy uh, communities to uh, find ways to improve greenness, but in the like, context-sensitive ways through partnerships with local organizations, for example. And they're also looking to diversify the, um, the profession of urban forestry. In New York, um, New York's funny because it's like where the high line is. It's the it's the poster child for inequity and you know green education research first came out of New York. But there are also are these really great community driven um, initiatives where um, people are doing urban greening in ways that really give leadership to community that involve them in learning how to plant and care for trees that um, make sure that they have decision making power of where those trees go. Um, and they're also working on, um, for example, making parks more equitable with their design um, and improving access in um, low canopy neighborhoods that are experiencing the uh, toxic effects of urban living. And then I, I include Detroit in this because I was there for a conference and it was super interesting. I um, got to meet a lot of local people and um, visit some of the um, uh, local green areas and there's a lot of food activism there. So, I think this is an interesting way to think about urban green equity. 
In Detroit, there are a lot of food deserts. A lot of people are having trouble accessing the basic necessities of, of life. And so um, organizations have uh, worked together to create these um, urban farms that share seeds across um, the city. So it's like a network of these farms. And then they also provide um, training and cooking and preparing food, as well as, um, like a, in this case, um, a, a bike program so that people can um, use their bikes to get food elsewhere in the city because the urban farms aren't going to provide you with everything you need to live. I thought that was very innovative and very uh, grassroots. And in Vancouver, um, I'm not going to talk about the work that Amelia has done, because you can talk about that yourself, but certainly in the Van Play document, um, there's, uh, uh, like, or I guess in, in Vancouver, I'm seeing a real um, increase in the awareness of certainly distributional inequity and um, a lot of you know, sort of spatial analysis and mapping work to identify zones for increased canopy cover and investment. And so this leads us to the issue of green gentrification, which is sort of this um, emerging concern, I suppose, in research and practice. Um, that I'm not as concerned about anymore as it used to be, but it's um, defined as the physical or psychological displacement of marginalized residents due to improvements to urban forests that increase the cost of living or create a sense of exclusion and barriers to urban forest access. So the theory is that when we install um, urban, urban trees or urban parks, we may be increasing the cost of living and then excluding um, residents from that space because it's too expensive to live there. Um, I think sort of more importantly, we may also be changing the character of the neighborhood so that people do not feel um, that the neighborhood is, is for them anymore, particularly in the case of redeveloped neighborhoods where um, the neighborhood is redeveloped for sort of higher income in movers, um, not for people who have previously lived there. And so a couple of students and I um, published a, a literature review recently that defines kind of three key dimensions of green gentrification that I think we need to attend to um, when we're thinking about this concept and, and especially when we're thinking about how do we green cities in a way that allows people to have or supports them in having better access to trees and green spaces but also allows them to stay in their neighborhoods, to be a part of the community, to um, share in the benefits that trees provide us. So, these, um, we looked at sort of the conceptual foundations of greening, the design and implementation of projects and social spatial changes that result from them. So conceptual foundations, and this is an important one. I, I mean, I, I like theory, so maybe that's why I think it's important, but the conceptual foundations of greening, I think, are really part of what's driving um, the green education when we see it. So, we are calling these subdimensions sustainability, capital, and green hegemony. Sustainability, capital is basically greenwashing. It's finding ways to make money out of greening. And um, I think we, we see this a lot in um, the way that developments are done or the way they're designed. And then green hegemony refers to this trees are good or green is always good mantra. And I think there are ways in which trees are always good or greening is always good, but that looks different for different people. And so attending to issues of um, inclusion and recognition of diverse needs and values is an important way to confront this potential driver of green gentrification. So we don't all think of trees and value them in the same way. We don't have the same relationships with them and we don't all care for them in the same way. And that's good. We need to acknowledge that and bring that into how we're doing urban forestry, how we plan and manage and develop our urban forests. Then sort of moving on from the conceptual foundations of green, um, when we are designing and implementing urban forests, and particularly in the case of sort of large-scale redevelopment projects, um, procedural injustice and the exclusion and suppression of some of the diversity around urban forests and urban greening can lead to or perpetuate green gentrification. So if trees um, are seen as, um, as commodities, um, but the community sort of has a different orientation to what trees are, and this influences how urban green spaces are designed. Um, if there is no accountability in the design process, then we experience procedural injustice, and those who, are, who should have been involved in designing what was going on in their neighborhood were not. And then finally, social spatial change. So this is the, what people normally think about 
when they think about green gentrification, the changes that we see on the ground that lead to the, the spatial changes that lead to the social changes of exclusion, um, physical displacement, or psychological displacement. And so this seems very serious, right? Like, the, when this happens, it's a big deal. If trees are really excluding people from their neighborhoods, this is not a good thing. However, uh, I'm here with the good news that um, our research mostly has been finding that um, although green gentrification is something that does occur, it seems now that a lot of what is happening is green is so tied up in development that all of your developments are green. And so I am now moving away from the idea that greening or trees or vegetation are the culprits for gentrification and sort of landing on the um, opinion that it's perhaps super obvious that humans are the culprits for gentrification and the way in which green development, especially in this region, um, really sort of co-ops green. It, in, it, it puts the blame on, um, on trees or the way we do development is almost always green now in, in this period of sustainability. And so if we really want to think about how we get trees into underserved areas, into low canopy neighborhoods, we need to think across systems and we need to think um, about new ways of doing urban forestry, I think. So we need to connect housing and greening, for example. They're not actually separate systems. They're systems that we experience together all the time. We manage them differently, we fund them differently, but they're not actually separate, right? They're just separate in our heads. Um, we also need to think about when we're, how we're prioritizing greening and when we're putting trees in the ground, and whether we're focused on putting trees in the ground or maintaining the trees that we already have and managing them appropriately. Um, I think we have sort of a culture of disposability or assuming that trees are disposable when in fact they're living needs that we share our space with. And so maintaining those trees as much as possible is important. But also moving towards greening that doesn't always, um, it isn't always associated with development or redevelopment. And so I think we have a really interesting opportunity right now to think about how we're doing urban forestry, how we're greening our cities, how we're doing urban greening in ways that are context sensitive, that respond to local needs of communities, that provide space for trees, that provide funding for tree management. I know it's a lot to ask. I think we're moving in the right direction. I'm kind of just here with a bunch of ideas, but um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what everyone else has to say. Now uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Amelia Nadova. So Amelia has 20 years of experience in the strategic planning, development, and management of urban and natural forests in Canada and Australia. Amelia is a principal at Diamond Head Consulting and has previously held the role of urban forester with the City of Melbourne in Australia. She specializes in developing and implementing urban forest strategies and policies to enhance the resilience of urban trees and forest ecosystems. Amelia and her multidisciplinary team work to engage municipal staff, professionals, and the community in solving urban forest problems. Her team has authored citywide urban forest strategies and regional planning guidances for urban forest climate adaptation and tree regulations. Diamond Head has now worked with more than 40 municipalities across Canada, the US, and Australia on arboriculture and urban forest uh, planning projects. So please join me in welcoming Amelia. Good evening, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and hear these fantastic speakers and uh, be in a room with uh, passionate uh, practitioners and advocates for urban forestry. So thanks for coming. I will uh, have a lot of ground to cover, but hopefully not too much overlap, and, and uh, we'll, we'll run through some of this material um, rather quickly. What I wanted to do tonight was give a bit of an overview on urban forest management planning and explain a little bit about what it is, some of the context that, that's important to you when, when we're developing a plan. And I wanted to end on uh, maybe perhaps a bit of an overwhelming number of solutions, but just to really drive home the point that there is a lot of amazing work happening out there 
in our in our region and beyond. And there's lots of there's lots of room for improvement, but it's a, it's an exciting time uh, as other speakers have, have mentioned. I will start with the definition as well. This one is about the definition of forestry. I didn't make it up; it's an old one. Um, the reason that I chose this definition is that it touches on the themes that are really central to urban forest planning and that if you read a you know, diamond net plan, most of our plans and other people's plans to incorporate these four themes. So really the urban forestry is about planning, planting, protection and maintenance and care of urban forests. Um, and the fact that those trees and forests are in and around uh, cities and communities and that we're managing those trees for the benefits that they provide. So when we're developing our recommendations, we are trying to think about that sort of holistic set of requirements for urban forest management. And as urban forest is where we're trying to maximize those benefits that we can produce uh, from the trees in our communities. Um, I've got three uh, sections here that I wanted to cover. One is, is this sort of intro to urban forest planning. Then just very briefly touch on the structure of urban forest management plans uh, and then dive into some of these solutions. Speakers have already covered the uh, myriad benefits of urban trees, so I will not uh, dive into the details here, but I think I do want to pick up on the thread uh, that has come through tonight of how uh, much more critical uh, urban greening has become in our cities as we face the challenges of climate change. And that was really brought home by the heat dome, which was a heat event that exceeded anything that we even sort of thought was an extreme that was, was going to um, occur in our region. Uh, tragically, we had a high number of deaths resulting from, from that uh, event, and those deaths occurred in, uh, in amongst the population of people who had uh, social deprivation factors that made them vulnerable uh, to heat. And uh, when looking um, at that event, uh, Sarah Henderson did some research and looked at the various protective factors for urban heat, uh, including proximity to, to roads, vegetation density, things like that, and found that vegetation within 100 metres was significantly reducing risk of heat-related illness and mortality. And it's also one of the only urban factors that we can control and modify. So really, um, a powerful illustration of how urban greening can reduce vulnerability to these types of uh, extreme heat events. And the coroner's report also highlighted the protection and restoration of urban forest as a priority action coming out of that. I also wanted to talk a bit about context because for urban forest planning, context is really, is really everything for us to make a place-based plan we need to understand context of the place we're working in. And so to sort of illustrate that, uh, I'm going to use this new urbanist rural to urban transit concept. It's come up in, in various planning forms in the past, and the idea behind this transit was that you could develop sort of smart code that spoke to each one of these typologies, and you could kind of have a best practices planning code that would, would achieve the ultimate outcomes or the best practices outcomes for each of these typologies. But when we're thinking about planning for urban forests, we're also thinking about all of these different contexts and as well there are certain policies and certain programs and certain interventions that work well in one type of this transect and, the, and you know don't work well in, in another. So when we're thinking about all these ranges of solutions and we're developing plans, we're seeking to sort of understand where we are trying to affect change. Another reason why this context is really important is that it, that it impacts um, the complexity of urban forestry. So as we move into from a more rural, rural to a more urban setting, we see increasing population density, we see increasing building density and lot coverage, we see increasing imperviousness, and along with that, typically we see decreasing canopy and decreasing ecosystem services. And that sort of speaks to that, that core issue of how we're designing uh, urban areas that um, allow for you know, healthy human populations. However, we also, along this transit, see an increase in cost and complexity for urban forest management. And I think some of that, this, this turnover of um, 
and this heightened interest in urban forest management is also related to the fact that our urban environments are becoming increasingly complex and increasingly dense as well. And another factor for, for our region, certainly we have urban containment boundaries. We're trying to keep development inside that urban containment boundary to protect nature, to protect our rural areas. And so we are going to see continuing densification as we try to accommodate more populations. It is, there is, it is the place for development. And so uh, that context for uh, trees in urban areas is becoming more and more challenging. I just sort of provide this as an example. This is sort of a typical um, single family neighborhood. Uh, historically, Metro Vancouver has this report on the trends in, uh, of canopy cover and purpose in the slope of time that Richard talked about. They also talk about these trends in single family homes. So historically, we have about 50% impervious cover on, on single family homes. But as we see with new development, as land has become more expensive, we put similar sized houses on much smaller lots. In this example on the left, you can see we can still accommodate some trees on, on private property. But on the right, we've got this small lot subdivision and there is space for trees on private property. And so, um, you know, Richard touched on this as well. Really, where we fit trees into these spaces is a land use policy decision. It's not a tree by law decision, it's about whether we factor space into trees in zone, um, for trees into zoning. And if we're not going to, then where are, we, where are we going to have trees? Is it going to be our public realm that provides that kind of cover? So when we're developing urban forest strategies, we're trying to think about these, how to create standards that will enable uh, healthy lumberwood trees to grow in public realms where areas are really high density, or how we'll support private green in areas where private land can support. I've touched largely on development and urbanisation, which is definitely one of the most significant sort of uh, you know issues or questions that we, we consider when we're developing these plans. But there's also a host of other issues that really um, influence us from climate change, equity, as the was, was speaking about, the capacity of our urban forest programs to respond to these challenges or to manage even the, uh, the resources that we have today, biodiversity, forest health, and reconciliation. Um, and stewardship. So these are, uh, it's a list here I think of issues that, that are common, that we're commonly thinking about and, and the context changes between communities as to which of these is you know, a, a pressing priority. They're always relevant but for some communities uh, some of these rise to the top more than others. So that local context is something that we're seeking to understand when we go and work with the city and that changes the types of recommendations we're going to make for planning, for planting, protection and maintenance, and for how uh, we recommend you know, engagement and stewardship with that community. Urban forest plans um, themselves have a, a fairly typical sort of structure. This is a screen capture from uh, the Byron Cities Lab. Uh, it's a helpful website if anyone's interested. There's a whole bunch of resources and best practices and things you can check out there. Um, this is an urban forest management plan toolkit. Essentially, the, the planning phase is sort of built around this, you know, what do we want, what do we have, how do we get what we want, and then, you know, who, who's going to take the actions to get there. So that one on the left there, that vision, inventory, assessment, strategic plan, that's a structure that, that, uh, that most plans follow. For us, sorry, this is a really old slide, what I don't like very much, but it does <laughs> like do, the, do the job more or less. Um, we we really always start with a review of you know the current practices and policies and that, that legislative context because that does create you know a bounds for us, a place where we begin. And then we want to look at the status and trends in urban forestry. So is the canopy cover growing or declining, or do we have a baseline? What's the condition of the inventory? All the types of things, the types of information that we really need to inform. Uh, good planning and decision making. And then engaging with the community is another key piece of that because the values of that community and the priorities of that community need to be aligned for the plan uh, to be uh, supported, to be accepted, and to, to achieve what the community's vision is. And that really sort of culminates into the, the plan uh, that it's been made. 
Um, also was asked to touch a bit on stakeholders, and, and this is a um, this is always a, a great question, and sort of a, I think I want to also make the point that urban forest plans, and as a consultant who comes into a city to make an urban forest plan, we're kind of like an ephemeral uh, force. You know, we come in, we we work with the city, we try to understand all the things that are happening, we do some engagement with residents, and then you know we write the plan, and then we're kind of off. And, um, but there's a whole host of stakeholders who are who are also really important in the process, and so. If we're thinking about those folks, well, these are these are stakeholder relationships that need to be built and are ongoing. And so, cities really need to be building these relationships and maintaining them over time. And we find that if we're working with a city that has relationships with these various stakeholders, well, then we do really tend to engage them in the process. And if they aren't engaged with those stakeholders, well, then we plan typically we make you know recommendations about how to do that relationship building. Uh, because these types of partners can be really enabling in the broader implementation of urban forest strategies. And I just put this list in here, I sort of came across it recently, there's a really interesting policy brief from the UN Economic Commission that, that came out recently, and it talks about what sustainable urban forest would be, and I thought it did a good job of capturing really what we're trying to, to get out with planning. So we, you know, we want it to be integrated, we want it to link Tree dominated components together. Um, we want to be having that, that long term view of the future. We want to be creating urban forests that are multifunctional, that are providing multiple benefits and meeting diverse needs. It also is a really interdisciplinary profession because it overlaps so much with planning, with engineering, with geospatial scientists. It's, it's really <laughs> plans always benefit from the collective kind of input of these different disciplines. Ideally, plants will be inclusive. And Ren spoke a lot about some of the barriers or some of the work that has to be done uh, still to get to that point. And I think as well, this last point about recognizing dynamic urban context is really critical too, because we are in a, in a system that is continually changing. And so we really have to have good adaptive, um, well, good strategies that are enduring, but also adaptive management processes that allow us to, to continue to sort of and make sure things are working. So some of the examples of solutions, I have about uh, five minutes here, so I'm going to go through these rather quickly. I put a lot in, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any of them, but I tried to align them with a range of sort of key issues that we have, and then talk about some things that are possible in our region and some things that, that are not, um, just to give you a sense of, of, of some of the things that happen out there. So, so when it comes to development and urbanisation, this is one we're always looking out for good examples. Um, there are a number of cities that have adopted sort of green standards, and Toronto um, has a green standard that I think is in its fourth iteration now. So for any uh, development that's five units or greater, there's a mandatory minimum requirement. So it sort of uh, provides a lot of certainty for development as to what the requirements are. But then they also have a tier two, so if you want to go further, you can get a, um, a discount on your development cost charges if you uh, create a, a development. It also applies across the range of sustainability um, <laughs> areas, not just landscape. Zoning, zoning is really an area, um, I think then the metro ban tree regulations really try to drive this home as well, that these land use tools are really critical for creating space for trees. Um, Ottawa has introduced this uh, zoning uh, where they require this minimum purpose area. That's not an uncommon requirement, but they require it to be consolidated so that it can support a tree. Public realm design standards, we have some really good examples in this region. Um, it's an area that is, is challenging because these are highly urbanised environments. It's expensive to put things like soil cells and structural cells into urban areas, but if we are having a Having a density that doesn't allow for any trees on private realm or only allows for trees on structure, then it's really our public realm, our streetscapes, where we have to support that tree canopy. And so having good design standards for those urban on the public realm areas is really critical. Had enough. There's uh, regulation toolkits. Um, We've got the metro uh, van on here for anyone who wants to see it. Um, but in this region, we actually have quite a few um, 
good bylaws that can be used for, uh, for regulation and so compared to uh, many other provinces in Canada can't even have private tree bylaws, so BC does have some really uh, good policy there. An area where we do need to do a lot more work is in climate change. Uh, we in this region are miles away from having species trials, from, from adapting our native forests. The US does have climate-based seed transfer tools. BC is supposed to have one as well, um, but that is an area where we need to do a lot more work. We also need to do a lot more work on planting trials in the, in the United States. Again, they have the USDA, which is the Federal Forest Service. They have a lot more support and they're doing a lot of this work, but we could also be uh, doing more work in this region if we were able to um, work together as, collectively across multiple levels of government. Equity, uh, planning with an equity lens, again, a very emerging area. A lot of this distributional equity approach, we've started using the American Forestry Equity Score. Um, I think that will become a fairly standard part of urban forest planning. Um, looking a little bit more broader, uh, Seattle has a racial equity toolkit that they use for their urban forest plan. Um, we've also tried to work with Bellingham recently and have uh, two elements of that into the process, but it was an interesting experience, but definitely one where um, there's a lot more work to do. And I want to talk a bit about program capacity because I think for our region that's a really uh, big deal for municipalities. We have quite small municipalities and for example, the federal funding for the Two Billion Trees program requires cities to plant 10,000 trees per year. But most municipalities in our region cannot plant that many trees in a year. It's, it's not possible. So um, Winnipeg has been able to access that funding, Calgary can access that funding, but we would need to pull together as a region to be able to access that funding. Provincial collaboration. In BC, we don't really have any supportive um, provincial level. It's not really a lot of the forestry interest at the provincial level. Uh, Manitoba is an interesting example because they do they have the forestry staff who support smaller municipalities and who are aggregators for the two billion trees funding for those smaller municipalities. They also have a forest council of professionals in that region um, who work together. In the United States, they have a phenomenal structure. They have federal, state, and uh, county level support, which is staffed by technical experts. So cities can go and they want to update their code, they can ask for that, um, that state representative to review their code, they can get their plan reviewed. They've got state level funding that means that if they are in every community, then they qualify automatically for other types of funding. So these are incentives for those cities to become every community. So there's a lot of a uh, good structure there that happens from that uh, top-down support. And um, NGOs, and I guess I, I really want to stress this, this is something that our region would, would desperately need, is an NGO that can help do that stewardship, that outreach and work across municipalities, because municipalities do not have the staff to, to run what it takes to have uh, a really uh, widespread stewardship program. In terms of biodiversity, again, this region has a bunch of great examples around um, biodiversity and conservation and planning. I think it's an area we do quite well. But again, uh, development permit areas came up earlier tonight. And in Washington, uh, they have state code that requires every municipality to have these areas protected. And so instead of having individual development permit areas, every municipality has to have these areas identified and the state code requires mitigation sequencing. So, and it doesn't matter if you're a private developer or a city, you have to compensate for any critical area that you impact. Everyone is the same way. It drives land banks, it drives land acquisition, all kinds of things. In Bellingham, I was trying to figure out if we could do this here. I don't think we can with our tax code, but a group of citizens there got together in the 90s and put a, a ballot measure on the on for greenways levy. And they've done it for four successive election cycles. It's been running for 20 years. It has brought in more than $100 million. They have acquired 3,000 acres of land. And this is over and above their parkland acquisition requirements for them uh, related to uh, development. When it comes to forest health, again, that's not an area where we do a lot of work. We have a lot of capacity at municipal level to do a lot of forest health monitoring. We do a bit of invasive work. 
Um, but there are uh, examples of Oakville and Ontario has uh, forest stewardship certification. They uh, check one third of their woodlots every year and identify and prioritize uh, forest health actions in those areas. Other cities too um, are doing uh, you know, studies on uh, different techniques. This, in this example, that uh, Burlington is planting smaller than typical caliper sized trees, which are much cheaper to plant, and they're inoculating them. They're trying to figure out essentially whether there's a different way of, of doing urban forestry to, uh, to try and uh, improve the outcomes. But again, these are things that really need sort of consolidated, I think, uh, regional support. And I think I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to run through here. But again, examples of potential legislation can be very enabling of urban forestry, and that's an area we haven't really had much discussion on. Reconciliation, City of Vancouver is doing a lot of really interesting um, work in this direction, exploring urban management, doing colonial orders. Sanish recently signed a memorandum of understanding with the Sanish Leadership Council, they've renamed. Um, Mount Douglas Park to Coles as one of the first sort of steps, um, the first things that they've done under this MOU. Um, so lots of sort of emerging work beginning there. Uh, the Citizen School Kit, which I think there are some examples uh, of out there tonight, which are great for individual sort of level action as well. Uh, and I'll, this is the last one here, the Green City Partnership. So rather than uh, having a regional NGO, in this case, 14 cities got together and co-funded a regional network they share tools, they share volunteers, and they just travel from city to city to do um, volunteer work. All right, so uh, <laughs> that uh, concludes my presentation, um, but I guess one of the take-homes I, I wanted to say was just that all levels of government, individuals and community, have the potential to play really important and powerful roles in urban forestry. There's a lot of them. That was amazing and telling some of the critical components of a good urban forest management plan, the importance of engaging stakeholders, as well as some really interesting solutions. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I would just like to say that I think we have Mayor Richard Stewart who has come in, and as well, I think I see Councillor Amy Elizabeth from Fort Moody here. So thank you so much. And I don't know if we've missed anyone else. Jennifer. Jennifer, hi, way up at the back here. Jennifer Lauderwick from School District 23. Thank you for the awesome introduction and thanks for the invitation to be here tonight and, and sitting through the fourth and last presenter. Really it. It. Um, Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Fourth and last presenter, so thank you for sticking it out. Um, so I, I did want to mention before I start in, um, the City of Westminster does have an urban forest management strategy. Um, thank you to Diamond Head. Um, we worked very closely with them. They were consultants on the project. Um, it is award-winning, which we're very proud of. Um, it took about 18 months for us to develop, to develop this strategy. There was a very heavy community consultation piece, and I'll speak to that tonight. Um, we began the process in about 2014. That's when I started with the city. This was my very first assignment. Um, so it's very close to my heart. Um, and then it was adopted by council in 2016. So uh, having been in place for about five years, um, I was invited this evening to share some lessons learned. Um, hopefully that's going to be helpful for um, the different communities that are here tonight. I'm pointing at the home screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so the presentation is uh, three parts. I'll just provide an overview of our strategy. I'll share some of the uh, status of the implementation again, over the five years, um, and then address uh, the five questions that were prepared by the panel um, and given over to me. So uh, quickly going through the overview of the strategy. Um, so a little bit about New Westminster. Um, we are highly urbanized. If you haven't been there before, um, it's a compact city of six square miles with a population of just under 80,000. Um, again, land constrained. Um, the areas for, that remain for urban and natural forests are constrained and fragmented. And actually, the need for an urban forest management strategy was brought forward by a council member, uh, recognizing that um, there was a visual or kind of perceived loss of trees um, and, and more development happening in our city. 
So it was a first step to developing an urban forest management strategy. Um, it was important for staff and community members to understand how we define the urban forest. Um, we we kind of did this pictorially. So um, trees uh, that make up the urban forest exist on both public and private land. That was really key for our community to understand. So whether they're in parks uh, and open spaces, in front yards, back yards, side yards, um, streets and boulevards, um, or on commercial or institutional kind of parking lots, um, the urban forest benefits all of us, whether it's on my property or your property. So that was an important key first step. Um, the next one was really understanding the metric. How are we measuring what is urban forest canopy cover? Um, so it's defined here, canopy cover means the proportion of land covered by tree crowns and is expressed as a percent of total land area. So think of yourself as a bird flying over a city and you see uh, areas of dark gray, which are roofs, the light gray, which is the streets, the sidewalks, um, the parking lots, and then the green, which is your tree canopy cover. So um, each of those make up a percentage of the total area. So we did this measurement for New Westminster. Um, in 2015, we were at 18% canopy cover. Compared to cities like Vancouver and Victoria, uh, we were on par, but when we looked at other cities like Duncan and Nanaimo, we saw some room for improvement. Um, the way we measured this, we looked at aerial photos for the last 20 years. Um, so from about 1994 to 2004, we saw a slight decline, about 2%. But then 2004 to 2013, uh, we saw a much greater decline at about 15%. Um, so we saw there, there's a correlation there. That was a big uh, development boom from New Westminster. Um, and most of that loss was occurring on private lands. So next step, um, quantifying, quantifying the benefits. Um, so again, measured back in 2015, the 18% canopy cover, um, we looked at metrics uh, like ecosystem services, so uh, cubic meters of avoided runoff per year, metric tons of pollution <laughs> removed, tons of carbon sequestered, and 80,000 tons of carbon uh, stored. I know you saw this um, cross-section earlier from time then, but uh, here it is again, and this was a really useful tool for us. And you'll see at the top, there's actually values assigned to each of those ecosystem benefits that trees provide. Um, really important point at the bottom, uh, there's an asterisk, an average of $5 return on investment for every $1 spent on trees. Um, but remembering that your trees have to live to be about 50 years old, to provide these ecosystem benefits. So we need them to survive and get big and healthy and provide these benefits. Another important message to our community. Um, we really wanted to drive home sort of the, the, the look and feel of urban canopy cover. Um, one of the things or uh, exercises that Diane did was looked at tree canopy cover per neighborhood. So to no surprise, Queensboro and downtown, the light is green. Uh, we're at 10% canopy cover. Um, those are the neighborhoods that saw the most development. When we looked at, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, the neighborhoods that had the highest canopy cover at 33, 32%, Queens Park, Glenbrook South, no change in land use. Single family homes, big mature old trees. Um, so it, it made sense that they have the highest canopy cover. And this really helped with our residents because they were able to um, to understand what a 10% canopy cover feels like and what a 33% canopy cover feels like and everything in between. So a really engaging tool. Um, as a next step, we looked at different canopy uh, cover scenarios. So where does our community want to go? Um, we wanted to set a, a canopy target. This is a direct uh, quote from our mayor. Uh, we want a target that is both aspirational and achievable. So scenario one, uh, I keep saying we, but that's us. Um, scenario one, status quo. If we did absolutely nothing and we continued on the decline, we would have another 2% of canopy uh, loss over the next 20 years, taking us to 16%. Scenario two, public leadership. So what if we only planted trees on public land? That would get us up to about 24% in the next 20 years. Uh, the next scenario we called shared priority. So what if we planted trees on private property and public property and we, we created a partnership? Um, uh, that would get us up to 27% canopy cover. And then the fourth scenario 
we called structural change um, because this really looked at planting trees beyond the number of plantable subplots that the city has, um, which means we would have to pull out buildings and parking lots and, and start a really uh, big change in land use across our city to get us to 40, uh, sorry, 40 percent, which um, is called the Pacific Northwest Benchmark. Um, so that one was ruled out because the city was not, <laughs> we were not going to be able to achieve that. Um, but our mayor and council were very supportive of scenario number three, the shared priority. So uh, in the end, we did develop a strategy with three overarching goals and a comprehensive set of 40 actions to reverse the current trend. Um, so getting us from that 18% to 27% um, over 20 years by 2035. Um, those three main goals to protect, we have to protect the trees that we have, um, and the new ones that we plant, we want to enhance the urban forest, so um, how are we going to plant and grow it for the future? And then, of course, engaging our community members, because this is not just on the city, this is on the whole community, um, if we want to keep our city livable and green. So what does this mean by the numbers um, in the public realm? So that's parks, open spaces, trees, and uh, sorry, streets and boulevards. We had to plant about 8,500 trees and on private property, approximately 3,300 trees. So in total, 11,800 new trees in a city that is six square miles big. <laughs> so we, we are challenged. Um, we were also further challenged by our mayor and council because they declared a climate emergency, like many other municipalities in 2019, and expedited our target from 2035 to 2030. Um, so we are doing it. I think. <laughs> I think we're going to make it. <laughs> Another really important step in the exercise was to find plantable spots for all these trees. We wanted to prove it out. This is a desktop review. Um, of course, it, it goes through a process of um, on the ground review with many departments before we're able to plant these trees. Um, but we, um, with, with Diamond Head's expertise, um, found 8,500 plantable spots um, across our city. And this is just, uh, again, the public land piece. Um, 2,200 trees in parks and open spaces, that's an important number for later in the presentation. And 6,300 trees on trees and boulevards. Okay, so a little bit about the status of implementation. Um, we have three, basically three categories of trees um, on public lands. Um, our streets and boulevards, so those are new trees. We get third-party money from developers uh, to plant trees on, on boulevards, um, and we also work with new trees, I should say. Um, and then we have green trees, which are um, trees that have to be removed for various reasons, and we have to replace them. Um, similarly, in parks and open spaces, we have new trees and our green trees. And natural areas, uh, same, same. So just, uh, an example of where we're planting trees in each of those three areas and how we're doing it. Um, so on our streets and boulevards, um, since adoption of the strategy, we have a tree planting master plan. It's kind of a companion policy to our strategy. Um, and it looks at where we're planting our street and boulevard trees over the next 10 years. Um, we said earlier we have to plant 6,800 new trees. Um, so this was really cool work that um, Diamond Head did. You've heard about equity mapping tonight. Um, and so this was our first sort of go at that. Um, the, the maps on the left are of our city. The, the top one shows density. So where do we have the most people living without front yards, backyards, and side yards? Um, the next one is which neighborhoods are deficient of street trees? So like actual numbers of trees. Um, the third is canopy cover. Where do we have our lowest tree canopy cover? And the fourth is actually numbers of seniors. So these are our most vulnerable, particularly when it comes to heat waves. Um, so when you layer all those things up, you get a map, a central map, and it starts helping us prioritize where we are planting our trees over the next 10 years. And when we get a resident who says, why am I not getting a tree on my boulevard, and they are getting a tree on their boulevard, we say because we are planting with this priority method per equity um, mapping. Um, okay, for parks and open spaces, this was huge. We're really excited about this. Um, the city received just under $1.75 million. Um, this was awarded to us in 2022. Uh, it's ICIP funding, uh, in Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. 
because we had a really strong urban forest strategy, we have leveraged money. So we're getting this money. We are now planting 2,200 trees in our parks and open spaces, and we will finish by the end of 2023. So this one's underway. And we're using the equity, map, excuse me, equity mapping for where we start and where we finish with our plan. Natural areas. Um, natural areas, so we are doing some reforestation. Um, we've also leveraged fifty thousand uh, dollars from Tree Canada. So these are for native tree and plant clubs, and we're planting those in four of our natural areas, and, and that was just completed uh, this past spring. So how are we doing towards growing robust urban forest? Again, uh, those three goals to protect. We have a very strong tree bylaw. Um, previous to the strategy, we only protected trees on city-owned lands. It now includes private lands. Um, I just wanted to mention really quickly, we did a lot of work with our mayor and council on our, strat um, our bylaw. We named three cities, A, B, and C, anonymously, and we shared with them what does a strong tree bylaw look like? What does it mean for our residents and our developers? a medium strength bylaw and a mild strength bylaw and what does that how does that impact our urban forest and, and the strategy that we're, we've created um, so really really important to explain those impacts um, <clears throat> i won't go through all of these but we've, we've improved and adopted um, tree planting strategies that again i described um, they you need good soil quality and you need good quality soil essentially in urban environments i will the other panels who's agree with we are torturing trees. They want to grow in a forest in an open uh, environment with, with lots of other tree roots and good soil. We put them in concrete um, pavers and, and tree grades. So um, looking at those best practices, we have a really good inventory of our trees, which we didn't have before. We know what we're losing, we know what we're gaining. Um, I, met, I mentioned the leveraging of funds um, and engaging our community. So I mentioned we have 3,300 trees and plants on private property. Um, we have a tree sale, I think similar to the District of North Man. Uh, these are caliper sized trees. We're selling for $10. Uh, we sell 300 a year, 150 in the spring, 150 in the fall, and it is sold out every year. Um, so we will get those 3,300 trees on private lands um, in that 10 years. Adapt a tree program, volunteer events for removals of invasives and, and native tree planting, lots of education and awareness ongoing. Okay, addressing the five questions. So, excuse me, sorry. Uh, question one, what, what are the benefits uh, to cities by adopting and implementing a, a comprehensive and effective strategy? Uh, for, for one, it definitely fosters education and awareness if it's done right and it's done well uh, by your community. Um, you gain value, you build value in your urban forest, and therefore you get support from your community and, and your mayor and council. Um, it ensures the protection and enhancements of urban forests to maximize all those benefits we talked about and we heard about from the other panelists. Um, it, it makes your city more livable over time. Um, it acknowledges trees as capital assets. We heard earlier they are they actually appreciate, trees appreciate unlike prairie assets which depreciate over time. Um, and it establishes goals and targets um, that may be used to attract funding, as I shared examples earlier. So the key steps to adopting and implementing an effective urban forest plan, number one, find ways to engage your community. Number two, um, do your inventory analysis and tell your story. This was easy to do tonight because it's a story. It, it's very logical, it makes sense, and, and the steps were, were all in place. Um, to tell the story specific to New Westminster, it will be different for your city. Um, integrate your best manage management practices that are a good fit for your city. Um, pick a target that's ambitious and achievable. Prioritize your implementation so you won't do everything at once. Uh, you want to look at short, medium, and long-term uh, goals and actions. Um, and then continue to make adjustments as needed. So we're, we're always doing that. Um, how does the urban forest plan fit with the city's official community plan, tree bylaws, and development permits? Um, I can't, I can't, I won't get into great, really great detail, but what you do with your urban forest strategy needs to be consistent with your OCP. Um, our highest action priority item was to adopt a tree protection and regulation bylaw because we were losing our trees on private lands. 
So we have um, strict replacements, uh, one for one for hazardous trees, two for one if you're moving a tree for any other reason. Um, we can encourage to retain trees on private land, we just we can't require it. Um, so we can help and handhold on um, ways to do that and to develop around trees. Um, but as we said earlier, the, you, you can't you can't uh, stop the removal of those trees. Um, but you can get proper comp compensation and two for one replacements. Um, tree permit applications are a big deal in our city. That is um, distributed from another department, from our development services department. So. There is a lot of collaboration between departments, um, not just parks and recreation, um, development services, engineering. That is uh, a key part of a successful urban forest strategy. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so this was a really cool exercise that Diamond Head led our city through. Um, we, uh, we had an all hands on deck approach, is, is one, one thing I need to say. Um, but we did these interdepartmental interviews and it was, it was kind of like a road show. Like, I think we must have done 25 <laughs> workshops because we met with every division in every department from operations to our policy planners. Um, and we, we asked everybody, what are the benefits of trees? What do we like about trees? And the, the, all these green things started getting written on the page. And then the other question was, what don't we like about trees? Why don't we like working around them? They, they bust out sidewalks, they break pipes, um, you know, they, they shed leaves, all these different, they're hard to mow around. Um, and this is our city staff. And in the end, the greens always outweighed the reds. Like, it was amazing. And I think in the end, everybody understood why we were creating the strategy, because the, the benefits outweigh the costs. So it was, it was kind of an easy exercise, but kind of an important one. Um, and really emphasize this isn't a parks problem. This is citywide policy. We are all contributing to this. And it's, it's not just on parks to, to implement. Um, and bring your mayor and council along, again, I can't emphasize enough from the very beginning, not only at the key decision points, meet early and often. Um, general lessons learned, um, again, tell your story, adapt it to your audience, it will build support. Assign a, champ, a staff champion to lead the process, that was me, it's exhausting, but it's so rewarding, and so if you're, in, if you're a city staff member, do it, like, totally do it. Um, private and public partnerships are key, and public leadership is mandatory. We still get phone calls from residents telling us when people are um, encro encroaching on tree critical root zones. People have the vocabulary in their city to understand the tree protection by law, and, and, and yeah, so, you, as a city, you want to do everything right. You want to show leadership. Um, revisit your guidelines and protocols for working around trees with your operations annually or as needed. Staff turn over. They don't know all the ways to be responsible when they work around trees. Um, that's kind of everything from, from turf maintenance to, to sewer and water maintenance. Um, forecast and budget for resourcing over time and prioritize your implementation. And you won't do it all at once. That's it. Thank you. I just want to say a huge thank you to you, Erica, for sharing your story and the story of a successful implementation of a really robust and, and good forest, urban forest management plan. That it sounds like um, there was a lot of background that went into it, a lot of effort that went into it, and the outcome and was well worth it. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, I probably don't can. I think I'm close enough to get here. Um, you guys have all touched on this, so I guess this is for anybody who wants to answer it. Uh, the, the pressures with development. So development, you've got you know the project leaders, the builders, the developers coming in, and they're changing swaths of our communities. And from my perspective, the, the change isn't making us more climate ready. Um, you know, you look at city center in Coquitlam, you look up at uh, the Burquitlam area, what was there before, you know, single family houses, a few trees, probably okay if we're talking about heat, heat domes and things like that. But what's getting built now doesn't seem like it's an improvement. And I guess my, my question is, what should 
we as, as a community and, and our municipal governments, what should we be asking from for developers to help us get ready for the climate conditions we're going to be living in in 20, 30, 50 years? So what, what should we be asking for? What should we be demanding from these developments that are changing our world around us? Saying New Westminster, there's a, a very different context. We don't have large swaths of forests, but we do have significant trees, um, you know, scattered throughout development sites um, or at, on the on the margin or on the border. Um, so we, we we talk about retention of trees if and where possible and and responsible or, or um, sensitive development. Um, we we have. Um, for significant trees, there's a, a large dollar value attached to those trees that the city then takes into a green fund, like other cities, and we look at planting trees in other locations. Now, I understand it's building is happening overnight, whereas trees, it takes 50, 60, 70 years for them to, to grow back to the same size. Um, and you might not have the, the land available to do so. Um, so some of the strategies that I know other cities are, are looking at is are through DCCs. Um, so collecting money in, in that sense, and I don't, I don't know if you have any more to say about that because you were speaking about DCCs. Um, so DCCs are development cost charges. So the, the, those are uh, assigned to a development that the city collects and use for infrastructure renewal. So it's, it's a very complex question that you've asked and um, I have I can help you out with some advice in terms of single family <coughs> development when, you know, with which is visible when we look up the hill and we see uh, the kind of development that's occurring. So you really have only two options. You, you find a way to retain trees as the development is planned and worked through. And from what I've learned, in my 30 years, you're gonna be more successful if you retain groups of trees and you retain smaller little areas. You even set up areas where you have pockets of trees that are retained around the corner, say where four properties meet. Strategies like that, because wind and exposure to, um, to sun and all of that makes for, uh, Trees are going to do better when they have support from each other. They're, they're social creatures, I think. Someone said they're, we need to treat them as being alive. They, 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 well, they are alive. But, but with, with social personality and social connection, they, they do better in an urban setting when they have their friends nearby, right? So trying to, to work through the picture I showed of that fir tree, of trying to work so hard to retain that solitary single tree is, is a monumental task. So you gotta find a way of retaining them as we plan and build these communities. And if you can't do that, then you've gotta find a program to put them back in and onto the property. Uh, New West, ourselves, we're giving trees to our, uh, our single family neighbors to put on their property. But it all comes with, uh, Erica talked about integrating and ensuring that You've got proper soil, you've got uh, conditions for these trees to grow. It's not just take a tree and plant it if the soil, the moisture, and the conditions aren't gonna be right. And so to do that properly, you need outreach. You need technical people that can go and advise people on planting a tree. And when we give a tree out, we give, uh, there's a handout that says this tree is best in these kinds of conditions. We do a demo, we do a YouTube video on how to plant it properly and all of that. So all of those things come into finding ways to encourage uh, afforestation on lot and getting those trees back onto the property. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is, is councils asked us to look at how are we gonna incentivize that? So how are we gonna provide an incentive? Uh, Erica talked about um, or mentioned these projects where if you exceed, or no, I can't remember where I saw it, but it, where, where you exceed the minimum replanting threshold, you're gonna get a, a credit on your DCC. That's a way of incentivizing tree canopy so one of the things we're looking at doing, and, and again, I'm taking some risk here in, in throwing this out there, but 
what we think we can do is we might be able to offer arboricultural service to a private property owner for them to retain a significant and mature healthy tree on their property. Because again, with such intensive land use, that's always the concern, how do you retain a tree safely in a confined space? So one of the things that, that is needed is monitoring of that tree. So if we can provide monitoring services free of charge to a neighbor, so they are not having to not only retain the tree at some perceived uh, detriment to their property use, and pay to have an arborist come in and look at it every four or five years to get their credit, maybe we can provide that service and in return we get the data, we know they're taking part in some incentive program and things like that. So th those are some of the things we're looking at. We gotta find a way of incentivizing private property owners to want to and to encourage them to look after and plant trees on their, on their property proper. Great, thank you. Um, Hi, Judy. I'm going to try and just talk loud. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, for years, uh, I'm, I'm in Port Moody, and we've got Amelia and Diamond Head working on our urban plan right now. And so, for years, it's um, what's shown up on uh, the media, especially on social media, is where are there's trees that are coming down. You always hear people responding, well, you know, it's not such a big deal because there's going to be a two for one replacement. So it's like a panacea. And then, so what I'm wondering about is when we're doing the plan, um, so when we're doing the plan, how, how much prescriptive language do you want to build in to that to those replacements. So in other words, are you looking at are, are we should, we should we be building in language about the particular of the diameter of the tree, the species of the tree, the canopy that the tree already offers, and should that kind of prescriptive language is that a good idea to be putting it in or are there limitations? that you might be finding yourself in if you impose a lot of prescriptive language. And then the second part of the question is, do you build that in at the DP permitting process or does that go in the zoning? You know, where does it, where are all the language, linkages for that kind of prescriptive language? It's, that's a great a great question, and it's not a, a simple uh, answer either necessarily. And there are a few different ways to, to do it. Um, the and there's a few municipalities out there that provide some kind of uh, potential lessons learned. So the most prescriptive bylaw that I'm aware of right now that that incorporates a soil volume requirement that incorporates a uh, replacement ratio, but it's a one-to-one -one replacement ratio if you're replacing with a large tree, it's two-to-one if it's a small tree. And if you cannot fit that tree on site, if you cannot meet the soil volume requirement for that tree on site, you don't get the credit, you have to pay the cash in lieu. So that's the City of Victoria. It also applies for trees on structure, so a tree on structure is not counted as a replacement tree unless it's in a metre of soil, a uh, metre depth of soil. So it's quite prescriptive. If you read the bylaw, it's ex it's very written, it's, it's a lot to get through. Um, and it's only a couple of years old. So, so you know, time will tell, I guess, to see how the outcomes of that are, are functioning. Um, other approaches would be to put it into zoning through a tree density requirement for landscaping. So you could have a soil volume and a, and a tree density requirement in landscaping. You could, uh, you can require a certain number of medium-sized or large-sized trees. So I think the city of Edmonton has that uh, type of prescriptive requirement in its zoning. Uh, Kelowna has a tree minimum now in its in its zoning for higher, not for single family, but for higher density. Um, there's limitations then too because you know zoning doesn't apply all the time, whereas a tree by law theoretically can apply, uh, you know, outside a development context as well. Um, there potentially could be development permit, could be a, a tool 
uh, that's used, you know, there's the climate adaptation development permit, I think I've got the name wrong there, but, um, you know, there could be the potential to sort of build in uh, development permits that really support that kind of um, outcome as well, or things like the Toronto Green Standard or uh, Green Factor, which are more, um, they, they do set a minimum standard for landscaping, but they also then give additional kind of flexibility for exceeding that, that standard and promoting a, a higher standard. Um, you, you also want to be uh, just a little careful. You want to have the right trees in the right places. Uh, one of the things we have a lot of issues with are residents come, they want, they plant a tree, they plant this beautiful tree and it starts to grow and then they, but they planted it right underneath their overhead utility. Or they planted a tree near their underground utility. And then, and then we, so we, we write, just by planting the wrong tree in the wrong spot, we set ourselves up for conflict. So it's really important and we spend a lot of time and have a, whole, a bunch of technical staff that provide this kind of advice. But New West, again, you know, set your goal and your target for what you want to achieve citywide. How are we going to achieve it on, okay, this is what we're going to do on our streets. So then plan your street tree program out properly. Know where your, utili your utilities are. Know the kinds of trees you're going to plant on this uh, street because th that species is going to do well with clearance because we know there's an overhead line there. So you, you've got to integrate and think of all those things through and then you come up with your on-lot strategy for uh, higher density development and then your single family strategy. So there's no real easy answer, but the right tree in the right place is always going to, going to help you be successful. Okay, thank you. And I think we just have question, time for one more question. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, there are so many questions. I'm, I'm going to make it quick, and it won't be a question, so you can squeeze in one more person here. Um, this is in response to Amelia. You had one of your slides talking about the Bellingham levy. Mm -hmm. um, you said that you didn't feel it was doable here. Um, so the city of Surrey has a very unique development cost charge that is focused specifically on the green infrastructure network acquisition, which is a biodiversity lens. Mm -hmm. And that was approved by council in 2021, and I believe it's the only one of its kind that you see right now. So, it local governments aren't able to do that kind of levy. It just wasn't called levy because that's more scary than saying development cost charge. So, it is doable here. Thank you, John. Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, I have a quick question for Erica um, and the U.S. Minister Tree Planting. Um, speaking on the terms of the right trees in the right places, I was just wondering if you could tell us um, what types of trees are they planting in New West? Um, specifically, you know, the major trees and are they deciduous or evergreen? Just looking for detail there. Great question. Um, Edward Nichol, I think, might still be here from Metro. Sorry, I think Edward Nichols is still here from Metro Vancouver, but he led the development um, of a climate adaptation tree list for Metro Vancouver. So that's our Bible. Um, we take our, our tree species from there. And when we have developers and residents coming in that need to plant replacement trees, we, we give them a list and say, pick from here. Um, we also guide them and, and we're doing this with our um, city tree planting. Um, again, picking the, the right tree for that, for that particular context. There's microclimate considerations. What's the sun exposure? Is it a dry or wet site? Um, as an example, um, are there overhead utilities below, um, sorry, above, and you need a smaller tree in that particular context? Um, you know, we're in our parks and open spaces, we're, we're picking the biggest tree we can find um, to, to grow over time. Um, uh, the rest, western red cedar, we know, is in decline. Um, with climate change. So we're looking at species from California, which are on the list for Metro Vancouver. So when you say native, not necessarily, really, really cool story. I'm just gonna tell very quickly. Um, we had a tree growing in a roundabout and this just happened a couple of weeks ago. There was a sewer utility underneath it. Um, this plant was, a tree was planted, uh, I believe about uh, 15 years ago. 
It's from Mexico. It's a really uh, rare Quercus that grows at high elevation. Um, it was bought uh, by a staff member at a nursery in Portland. It was brought to our greenhouse. Long story short, it ended up in a, in a roundabout in a street, and it has doubled in size. It loves the hot, dry conditions. It, it, it thrives in the wet uh, uh, winters here. Our engineering department contributed a large sum of money to move this very large tree uh, and transplant it into a park space. Um, so an example of a, a very, we think it might be the only one in Canada. <laughs> like it's, it's quite rare, um, but it loves, it, 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 it's, it was so important for us to save. UBC has cuttings, uh, nurseries have taken nuts. Um, everyone wants to propagate this tree because it's, it's doing so well in our cli uh, changing climate and certainly not native, so. So who's name that Bible again, the Climate Adaptation Species List? Um, Edward, you might even have a copy of it in your back pocket. Education. Species List? Yeah, the Urban Tree List for Metro Vancouver and the Changing Climate. Thank you. Thanks. Can you find it? Is it a couple of the Metro Vancouver and the Changing Climate? Thank you. Yeah, Hey, well, thank you so much. Um, we're going to start to wrap the event up, but there may be some opportunity for informal conversation after the event um, closes. Just want to be respectful of everyone's time here. But before the closing remarks, I just would like to make some acknowledgements. So first of all, we would like to acknowledge, of course, our wonderful speakers tonight. So Richard Boaz, Dr. Lorian Nesbitt, Amelia Ludova and Erica Mashik. So, and I think just the turnout tonight shows what an interest there is in trees in our community. So, I really appreciate everybody making the effort to be out here. Um, I'd also like to thank Burke Mountain Naturalists for very generously sponsoring and supporting tonight's event in partnership with Protect Coquitlam's Urban Forest and Weber's Tree Fellowship. And also to the local groups who came out and made displays, so Riverview Horticultural Center Society, Maple Creek Streamkeepers, Burke Mountain Naturalists, Protect Coquitlam's Urban Forest, the Cool Hoods Program, and Weber Tree Fellowship. And again, thanks to Tri-Cities Community Television for covering the event tonight. And a link to the video will be available soon. Um, I'd like to thank Siobhan and Douglas College for giving us the venue and making this possible. To Tri-Cities Force of Nature and, and uh, Tri-City News and uh, Dispatch and even Ravel, who gave us both local and national coverage for this event. Um, to all the elected representatives and the staff, city staff, who came out. <laughs> so we thank you sincerely for being part of this conversation. Um, and to each one of you, of course, who came out in support of a healthy urban forest. It's amazing and, and so gratifying to see people out here. Um, I'd also like to just say one special thank you for tonight, and that goes to Kathleen wallace -Dearney. Um The whole form. So the idea behind this form was inspired by Kathleen. She really put a lot of extra effort in to make sure that all the pieces came together, and that we had amazing speakers and a great turnout. So thank you, Kathleen. As did Nancy Fernandez. Yes. Thank you. Thank you too, and you're surrounded by amazing people. That's all I. Um, I also want to say that we hope that you come away um, from tonight's forum with a really solid understanding of what the urban forest is, and I think you did a great job in, in conveying that. And also, why it's so critical that we maintain a healthy urban forest, both now and into the future. So there's something that each one of us can do to help. And whether you're a resident, you're just learning about the urban forest, or whether you're a professional or an elected um, representative or city staff, there's something that your involvement can do to support a healthy urban forest. 
and to help our cities and our region adopt and implement policies for a healthy urban forest. So let's really commit to working together um, to fulfill our responsibilities for future generations so that they can also thrive and benefit from all the, you know, the good things that trees bring to our community. So our call to action to you tonight is to stay engaged and when the um, urban forest management plans come available for public consultation, to give your input and to provide meaningful input to make sure that we get the best urban forest management plans that we can. Um, so when you came in tonight, you were handed a flyer, and if you didn't get one, I think Kathleen has some there. Um, and it's action ideas, what you can do. So take a look at that, and we also ask you to stay connected with us. And you'll find our email address on the handout, or you can also leave your email address with us at the registration desk. And um, we can, if you're interested, send us an email and we can make sure that you have a link to the uh, Dry Cities Community TV coverage of this event. So we just want to say thank you so much again for coming out tonight. We hope that you'll stay in touch and we would love to see you again at the next Tri-Cities Urban Forest Forum. So thank you.